like to welcome you to the Atlanta Lodge, uh, the Theosophical Society here, the Atlanta Lodge. And we offer these free public uh, uh, presentations every Sunday at 3 o'clock. Today we are going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Bruce Cunningham. Uh, he's a PhD, and he has been uh, a serious student of the shaman, shamanic practice for over 15 years now. Bruce is also an author, and he works in private energetic healing practice in, here in Georgia. And he's going to give us a glimpse into uh, the ideas behind shamanism. So would you please join me in welcoming Bruce. Thank you. morning or good afternoon. Um, what I'd like to do is take just a really brief moment and share with you um, what a shaman is. And the, one of the very best descriptions that I've ever heard given of what a shaman is and what a shaman does was given by a man by the name of Alberto Violdo, who is a medical anthropologist who has been studying shamanic work in the Amazons and worldwide for well, probably about 30 years now. If you take Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, it's one we all learn in school as little children. What that means is energy is equal to the mass times the velocity of the speed of light squared. It's an equation that tells us in the universe that energy and mass are balanced. And the shaman dances on the equal sign. What it means is he is able to live in the world of mass or matter, and he is able to operate or live in the world of energy. What a shaman does is, by choice, enters into and exits out of at will between ordinary and non-ordinary reality for the benefit of his health, his patients, and his community. Um, if you look at ancient tribal shamanic practices, um, a good example of benefiting the community is the Salmi shaman in Finland and Norway, in Sweden, along the Arctic Circle. As the springtime would come and their food supplies are getting low, the shaman would enter into a trance state and go out and find the reindeer herds. They would then return back to their community tell them where to find the reindeer herds, which sometimes were 50 to 100 miles away. They would go there, find the reindeer herds, harvest those, and bring them back to the community. If the shaman was wrong and sends their hunters 100 miles in the wrong direction, then the entire community would starve to death. Um, so that's a just one example of how he affects outcome of community. Um, bringing it to a more individual basis, the shamans in indigenous communities throughout time and even today heal individuals from diseases. Uh, if you are in any indigenous culture in the world today, you will still find practicing shaman. The, the path that I am on um, is the path of the Laika shaman from the highlands of Peru. Uh, I'm sorry, could you speak up just a little bit? Certainly. Does this work at all? Yeah, oh, well, heck yeah, let's use that. Um, yeah, the, the path that I'm on is that from the Laika of the Peruvian shamans. Uh, the Laika were a, and still are, a, a group of Indians who, at the time of the Spanish conquest into America, uh, understood that the, there you go, understood that the, the, the Spanish were coming, and before their arrival, left the lowlands of Peru and went up into the mountains. Um, the 
Spanish came in and essentially destroyed all of any religious understanding, any spiritual work that, that was being done within Central and South America because their main driving force, of course, was the Catholic Church. It's interesting to note that the uh, Catholic Church still only has one office of the Inquisition open in the world today, and that's in Peru. Um, so, you know, all of you who thought that the Inquisition was over in the 1700s, almost, it's still going on in 2009. Um, but the Laika went up into the high altitude of the Peruvian Andes. They live between 17 and 20,000 feet year round. They do come down on rare occasions for particular festivals that uh, you know, take place at some of the sacred and holy sites in, in Peru. A little bit about me personally and how I started onto the shamanic path. Um, so I was sharing just a little while ago, from a very young child, I knew that there was something different about me. I'm sure that, um, you know, when I find when we address groups that have an interest in spirituality, in stepping beyond the, I guess, the norm, we often find that there are people who have very similar experiences, the ability to see ours, the ability to see people who have passed on the ability to see, uh, you know, existing spirit energies in the physical world. But when I was about five years old, <clears throat> I was with an older brother and sister, crossing the street one time around Christmas, um, and we walked up the street. I was looking at the Christmas lights. They stopped at the light. I went on across the street and was hit by a car. Um, the interesting thing about that, though, is I remember very plainly, very distinctly, part of me standing on the sidewalk, watching my physical body walk into the street. And when I tried to explain that to people at the time, they weren't particularly interested and you know, didn't particularly have any, um, lend any credence to that explanation. Years and years and years later, as I began to feel that very compelling draw back into the shamanic practice, um, I understood very clearly that the shaman often leaves his body and his consciousness can be in one place and his physical body will be in another. And that was the occurrence that took place at that time. My spirit fled from my body at that point in time because it was aware that it was going to be hit and the spirit didn't want to suffer the same trauma that the physical body was going to suffer. Um, <clears throat> I then grew up very much normal as everyone else, went into college, went into engineering, became a systems theorist where I studied how systems work and why systems work. And essentially, I began to discover why systems don't work. And the more I looked at the world that we live in, the more I understood it did not work. And I was able to understand why. I was able to understand why is because we have separated ourselves from the world around us. We insulate ourselves. We don't live in the world. We live on the world. And that's a, a difficult separation for a spiritual body to endure. Um, I finally closed down my engineering consulting practice about three years ago when I found that I had more people coming to me to talk to me on a daily basis about the work that I was doing as a shaman and their personal healing than I had coming to talk to me about doing engineering consulting and, and things in the world. So I made a decision at that point to move from working in ordinary reality to working in non-ordinary reality. And that's what I do today, is I have a, an energetic healing and consulting practice. Um, I haven't gotten away altogether. I work with you know, corporations. I'm working right now with a company doing projects in Africa, where I bring their corporate soul back to where it should be. Um, 
you know, we all look at the bank debacle of last year. That's a perfect example of a corporation suffering soul loss, where they have lost the character of the corporation and the soul of the corporation. And I helped to get those back. Um, what we want to do is kind of, we've moved down the road a little bit. We want to step into the traditions of the shaman and what it is that a shaman will do specifically to affect healing within his community. Um, starting out, I guess most simply, uh, if you take an individual in a community or in a tribe who is suffering from a disease, from the shamanic perspective, there is always, it's either a soul loss issue or a power loss issue. And you can lose a part of your soul through traumatic events. Um, you know, I gave you one a little while ago, me stepping out in front of a car. Uh, things like rape, uh, physical abuse, just any type of trauma, you'll find that the soul separates off in pieces. Um, the Tungus in, in uh, Mongolia, some of the originally studied shamanic tribes, believe that there were 32 parts to your soul. And when you lost one or two, you were like everybody else. When you began to lose around five to ten, then you began to just exhibit signs of illness. When you lost 20 or more, you were gravely ill. When you lost all 32, you died because your soul had fled your body completely. So it was, at that point, the vocation of the shaman to step into the non-ordinary reality and to journey out and to find these fragmented pieces of soul and bring them back to the suffering individual. That is something that we do all the time now, and it's a really amazing experience. Um, the shamanic worldview is very, very similar to um, that. And in kind of doing some background research for the talk today, uh, Madame Blavatsky in her book, Isis Unveiled, talks about shamanism as being the world's oldest religion. Um, Within my tradition, there are Laika shamans who can go back over a thousand generations and name the shaman who were in line before them. And that, you know, brings it to a very great old age. The, the shamanic worldview is such, we believe that there is an underworld. The underworld essentially in a modern psychological perspective would relate to our unconscious or our subconscious mind. Um, there is a middle world, which is the ordinary reality that we exist in every day. Then there is an upper world, which is essentially our superconscious, that which uh, is the place where we experience ecstasy, uh, that's invoked through a number of different recourses. You know, it can be the birth of a child, uh, you know, any of those types of things that bring that ecstatic state uh, takes place in, in our concept of the upper world. The shaman moves between these three worlds at will, does so through a concept that they call the axis mundi, or the, the center post, or the tree of the world, um, called by many different things in many different cultures. As you study those cultures, if you go into the Amazon, into their large tribal buildings, they have a center post, which is the, the center post of the world. It takes you to the lower world. It takes you to the upper world. Um, the uh, Mongolian tribes actually use a tree in the center of their village to represent that tree of life or that tree of the world. Um, 
when a soul fragment then splits off, typically it will descend into the lower world. Uh, it will return to what we term as the mother. It, it goes back to the place where it recognizes safety. The, the shaman then journeys into there uh, using several different methods. Rhythm is probably one of the most common used in shamanic uh, expression. The drum, the rattle, uh, tapping, the, you know, the, the click sticks that are used by the uh, Australian Aborigines. All of these things will, with practice, bring the ability to descend into your subconscious. When you get there, you find the discussions of uh, Carl Jung when he talks about the collective unconscious is really quite valid because as I come in there, I can find through the assistance of spiritual allies a fragmented soul part. And beyond finding the soul part, I can find why it left. I can find the, the place of the original wounding. That original wounding is probably not the one that you remember. Um, we tend to repeat over and over and over again as we go through life the very same patterns, and they magnify as we go through life. We start out with an abusive parent or an abusive sibling, move to an abusive job, move to an abusive relationship, with a husband or wife. Um, and as we get to the point, as we suffer the soul loss all the way through that, we might think back, you know, I am hurting right now from a spiritual perspective or from a soul perspective because I've just had this physical argument with my spouse. And as you go to look at that soul loss issue, we may find that it's not this spouse, but was a spouse or a relationship long, long ago. It can be a familial imprint, not coming from you, but coming from your grandparents or your great-grandparents or your great-great-grandparents that has been passed down energetically through your, your line that is now expressing in your particular life. So we can go in and we find that fragmented soul part. We find that place of original wounding. It's important for one reason, so that it can be acknowledged and let go. To go back over and over and over again to that point of original wounding has no value. But to understand what took place and why it took place has a tremendous energetic value. So we receive that soul part back. Typically we go in, um, also at that point, that soul as it comes back will bring with it um, a particular gift that may be symbolic in nature, that allows it to anchor to this physical existence. Often we bring back a, a power animal, as we talked about the sense of disease in us is brought about by loss of power. And it's because we lack that power, we lack the ability to um, make the courageous decision to step out where we should be stepping out, that a power animal or a spirit guide animal can be of great assistance. So we bring these back from the subconscious. We retrieve them from that collective unconscious and bring them back to the individual. And we do this in a process called a, you know, a soul retrieval journey, or an illumination is another word. That brings us to the next issue, is we have a physical body, and we also have an energetic body. And the energy body surrounds the physical body and informs our physical body of how to build itself, how to repair itself. I was looking at one of the brochures back there, you know, talking about uh, the death process. And it shows an individual with a, an aura around their body. That aura 
is a part of that energetic, physical, luminous body that we have. When we suffer a soul loss, typically that blueprint, that physical body, is informed by the energy body, which is the blueprint. It gets damaged, it gets wrinkled, it gets a piece torn off of it, you know, if we relate it to a physical state. When we bring the soul parts back, when we bring that power animal back to the person, we also repair that energetic body so that it will inform the future reconstruction of that body in a manner which is whole and healthy rather than the damaged, torn, you know, blueprint part that we had before. So, you know, as we bring that soul part back to the body and repair that energetic field, the body then begins to experience healing repair. Um, there are, again, the two parts. You have a physical body, you have a, an energetic body or a spiritual body. The shamanic work is geared toward that spiritual or the energy body. For the physical body, herbs are very often employed. Um, in uh, Central or South American shamanism in the Peruvian and the Brazilian Ecuador down in the uh, Amazon River Basin, they use a, a plant called ayahuasca. It's a Banisteriopsis capi. It's a lanai vine, grows into the trees. Uh, it has in it a component which is called harmaline or harmine. There are two different chemicals there. They are a MAO inhibitor, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. When you bring those into your body, it stops the ability of monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme in your digestive tract, from, from working and doing its proper function. They have a second part to the, the herbal blend, and this is called ayahuasca. The second part is either Psychotra viridis or um, Mimosa hostilis. These are different plants from the Amazon. These have within them a chemical called DMT, which is dimethyltryptamine. That is a chemical. It's produced by our body. It is what scientists now think produces the ecstatic experiences within our body in a natural state. Um, it is, however, metabolized in your bodies very, very quickly. And when you consume the ayahuasca, which has the MAO inhibitor and the DMT, it allows you essentially to remove that conscious impediment that we have as human beings between the ordinary and the non-ordinary reality. Um, so when in the Amazon they're doing healing, often the patient and the shaman will both do this herbal drink called ayahuasca. And what that does is that allows them to move into non-ordinary reality together and relate within non-ordinary reality in a way far more profoundly than you can in the physical or ordinary reality. So stepping into that um, herbal healing is a part of you know, the shamanic work all over the world. Again, in the Amazon, they use the ayahuasca. In Africa, they use a plant called iboga, which has very much the same thing. Within Native American culture, they use uh, the peyote cactus, you know, the mescaline. So within the, the traditions all the way through, you find that there are plant helpers that have stepped into that particular role that allows that transition into that non-ordinary reality in a much, um, I'm not going to say simpler because it's not simple, but in, within a, a much easier application. Um, 
the thing that brought me to this particular path of shamanic work is at one time um, I was on a particular journey and within that experience of non-ordinary reality I was shown physical things of how to access um, the cosmos, okay, how to, as I explained it to my wife after I had returned from the experience, they said, you do this, and you take the top of your head off, and you can see God. That's essentially the description that I gave to her. And at that time, she was living here in Georgia. I was living out in Utah, finishing up some of my projects that I had to do out there. But we were both reading the same book. It's called Shaman Healer Sage by Alberto Violdo. And she called me up about two or three days later, and she says, have you gotten to this page yet? And I said, no, I have not. And she says, well, go there now and look. And so I went into that section of the book, and essentially there in the book, they're talking about what they term the seer rights, or the rights of second sight, where essentially what you do is you connect your third eye back to your occipital part of the brain by creating energetic pathways within that energy body that surrounds your physical body. And this is what I had done. And like I say, essentially what it does is it opens up quite profoundly that ability for second sight. And it was, like I say, shortly thereafter that I became quite a fan of, you know, Alberto Violdo and the work that he's done in the shamanic field because I had received an independent verification that you know, things that he was teaching had validity in their, in their scope. So the, the illumination or the soul retrieval or the spiritual journey is, I guess, the basic tool. Where we talk about power loss or energy loss in an individual causing disease, there's a second part of that same, or a corollary part of that same equation, is we can acquire around us, or have essentially stick to us, energies which are not our own. Um, these can take place in several different fashions. Um, I can give you all a really good example if you are listening to a piece of music that you find very pleasant, that you find very soul soothing, and someone pulls up next to you in a car and they're blasting their stereo and you can hear it better in your car than you can hear your own music in your car, and it is a horrible piece of music, and you can feel your energy level go from here to here almost instantly. And that's that low foreign energy displacing yours. Um, we can get into a whole day-long discussion of, you know, quantities and values of, of energy. But you can have the low energies attached to you. You walk into a place of business, you know, you can tell the boss has been yelling at everybody, your energy level drops immediately to match those around you. You can take that home, you know, they talk about your boss yells at you, you go home and yell at your wife, your wife yells at your son, son goes out and kicks the dog. You know, that's, that's that low foreign energy attaching to you and you're carrying it around with you. So another thing that the shaman does is he extracts foreign energies. Um, those foreign energies, like I say, can be environmental. They can also be individual entities that, uh, for instance, if your Aunt Martha dies and you were her favorite niece or nephew, she can very easily come to you in the energetic state and attach to you because you are of the very close affinity and there are no physical uh, boundaries that restrain that energy after she's left her physical body. So when we do what's known as an extraction from an individual, we always treat the entity or the energy as something which is benign, even though it may be 
very angry, like I say, it may also be Aunt Martha. So we have a process where we do soul extractions or you know, energetic extractions from an individual. In the Amazon, it's really funny, they do it by sucking on, you know, typically it's around the neck area or wherever they find the, the energy concentrating. Um, typically when a shaman will do this, he will suck it in and try to hold it in his mouth. Often it will go elsewhere in his body and he'll spend several days vomiting this energy up out of his body. Um, but the, the next type of thing that, uh, that a shaman does is rites of passage. Um, when children are born, when they gain maturity, when uh, people reach particular status levels in their life, when they're getting ready to pass into old age or as they're passing into old age or at their death, they also essentially administer within their community at that time those particular events in their community. Um, within our Western culture, we have essentially lost that, the celebration of that passing from phase to phase in our life. When, when people get old, we tend to hide them off in the corner and not celebrate that saging that they've come to. The ability for them to share back into community that ability, that understanding, that experience that they have developed over their lifetime. So the shaman works in celebrating each one of those stages. And there is a you know, particular ceremony that we have at the time of death and afterwards um, the shaman acts as what's known as a psychopomp, which is the individual who escorts the spirit from the body to the afterlife. And that in and of itself is an amazing experience. So that's the, the type of things that a shaman does. They've found the roots of shamanic practice in every indigenous culture on earth. Um, you find the very same core of the shamanic practice in Central Africa as you find in Eastern Asia. The people have never had contact. Their you know, communication ability was non-existent until just a few hundred years ago. Yet you go deeply into their culture and you find almost identical shamanic practices from one culture to the other. And you need to look and say, why? And, you know, the, the ethnologist will tell you, well, it's a, <clears throat> it, it can go and bleed from one society to the next, but that doesn't explain it across oceans. Um, and the only other way to explain it is that it's risen independently in each location through a energetic field that attracts people to that particular practice. Yes? Um, you mentioned that uh, the shaman takes the person, whoever, has some sort of problem, mm -hmm. maybe disease or something. And do they both then take this potion or whatever it is? Or is it just the shaman or the person whose disease? It depends on their disease. Um, the, the ayahuasca is a, an individual who is very, very attuned to the effects of the plant, what it has an ability to do, and reads the individual at first. Um, there are some things that the, the consumption for the individual won't have any value for. But typically, they will both take it. Okay. Yeah. Is it, it, is it like a half hallucinogenic thing a little bit? Or what? 
It is, and you know, the, the term that they're preferring now is entheogenic. The hallucinogenic um, implies that what you're seeing is not there, whereas from the shamanic perspective, what you're seeing is existing in the non-ordinary reality. So... It, it enables them to go into a different realm. It does. Like I say, it's, it, it peels away... Um, Essentially, the DMT affects the pineal gland, it's right smack in the center of the brain. Um, and in, in doing so, like I say, it creates that ability to essentially take off the top of your head and remove the, um, the cognitive inhibitions that we have to entering into the non-ordinary reality. Um, a little bit more about it. Its its Spanish name is La Purga, you know, which means the purge, and it is one of the most foul-tasting, you know, brews or teas that you'll ever have the occasion. Extremely bitter, um, long-lasting in your mouth. Uh, within usually a half an hour or so, you are purging. And you're usually it's it's quite a violent vomiting. Um, within probably three or four hours, the experience is over, but you'll have, then be purging with diarrhea for another period of time. Uh, so one of the things, in addition to the experience in non-ordinary reality it cleanses the body in a physical perspective also and removes, you know, large volumes of parasites and bacteria and things like that which may be ingesting the, the system. So, yeah. So when, the, when typically the shaman and the, the person ingest this uh, a potion, then uh, uh, does this person then, you said that they can recall from previous ancestors. Yeah, it, it depends. The Each disease has a different origin. They often manifest themselves similarly in symptoms. So, you know, for instance, I can go to a Western doctor and he will diagnose me as having a stomach ulcer, okay? And we'll have 10 people that all go to the same concept of medicine into Western medicine, they can all be diagnosed with an ulcer. You take them to a shaman, and the shaman, upon his working with each individual, the symptom that's being expressed is the ulcer, but the cause of that disease may be, or typically is, different in each individual. That's why, from a Western perspective in medicine, I can work on a symptom of your disease. I can cure a symptom of your disease. Western medicine does not cure a disease. It manages symptoms. And it does that through, you know, poisons, through cutting it out. Um, but like I say, it does not step into the realm of going to the cause of that disease and resolving that issue. So by going to the cause, what you're saying is No, it's not an intellectual process at all. Um, I talked about the energy body, the, the luminous body that surrounds our physical body, it carries a blueprint for your physical self. When the shaman comes in and affects change within that energetic body, it rewrites that blueprint. The body physically changes itself. You know, the atoms in the body exchange themselves about every eight months or so. Um, when they are being written with a new blueprint, the body then repairs itself over time. Um, when we're talking more about, for instance, a psychological manifestation of an illness, um, 
you know, where someone has depression or schizophrenia or one of those types of disorders, one of the things that takes place in a, uh, I want to say a mental disease, with a mental condition, is they create barriers between themselves or their psyche and the outside. And so from a psychologist or psychiatrist point of view, they're trying to get inside from outside. From the shamanic perspective, what we do is we change the energy body, which changes the physical body, which changes inside, and the pathways for protection are designed to be resistant to outside force, not to inside change. And so we find that with uh, psychological disorders, shamanism is profoundly effective. Have, have there been any studies by any um, associations? Of there are, um, and I think probably the most, um, one of the more telling issues is the fact that I probably know of a dozen psychologists and psychiatrists now who are incorporating shamanic practice into their everyday office work. So, so basically the person drinks this potion. I, I still don't quite understand how they achieve this uh, healing. Is it just drinking the potion and vomiting it? And no. The... Disease, like I say, from the shamanic worldview, is caused by power loss or soul loss. Okay. The reason that we, in a normal perspective, are suffering from that soul loss or the power loss is because we are constantly engaged in ordinary reality. The only way to retrieve those losses that we have suffered is through non-ordinary reality. You can have a shaman go into an ordinary reality and get it for you and bring it back. Or you can go in there yourself and experience that recombining of your soul and the achievement of the power. So the, the ingestion of ayahuasca or iboga or peyote or those types of things, what it does is it takes the consumer of that product into non-ordinary reality. And typically, uh, it profoundly alters their worldview. They understand all the world around them quite differently when they return from that journey than before they left. Um, in Central Africa, the aboga ceremonies usually last for about three days. Um, you go in, the first couple of days are spent uh, in dietetic preparation, go out and you collect the herbs, you bring them back, you prepare them, and then, like I say, the consumption takes place over about three days. Uh, essentially, it reduces your physical body to a quivering heap in the middle of the floor. But your emotional, subconscious, psychological body is essentially disassembled and then reassembled without all of the um, illusion that you suffered from before. And like I say, it, it typically quite profoundly changes worldview. They're having tremendous success, for instance, using iboga treatment for heroin addiction. That within five days, they can take someone who's been addicted to heroin all of their life and change that within a week. So <clears throat> it's not that it, it acts chemically on the body. What it does is it changes their worldview and they understand life differently. And where the pursuit of that separation that the heroin brought them is no longer a goal. And they understand that everything is connected from that point on. Yeah. When you mentioned um, like mental disease and all that, what about children who are born with autism? Is that um, a reversible in that 
Yeah, if you if you look at a lot of the research that's currently being done on autism, uh, it will disagree that they are born with autism, that it's actually inflicted upon them at a very young age. Um, the current research on autism says that it's probably the thimerosal in the childhood injections. If you look at the United States, it's like 80 times more prevalent than it is in the rest of the world. That's because we have the childhood Im immunizations. Um, but yes, I have worked with autistic teenagers and within a couple of weeks have brought them back to a much, much more substantially normal functioning of level. Um, the, the human body has a tremendous capacity to repair itself, to function on a normal basis. It wants to function normally. Um, the disease, the malfunctions caused by our diet, by our environment, by the you know the energies that we live around, you know the high tension power lines and those types of things, all really profoundly affect our our bodies that we just don't understand. You know, if you look around a room, you know, 90% of the people wear watches and we wear them with a little battery in it and a little quartz crystal that keeps time. And unfortunately, when you start to look at the energy body and you see the energy flow down their arm and you look at where their watch is or if they've even taken their watch off for a couple of weeks after they've taken the watch off, you see a big disturbance in their human energy field at the location of the watch. It's that subtle. And you know, we have for years and years and years really um, discredited the concept of the human energy field. Um, just this last week, I was reading an article um, about how they've actually determined now that the human body is bioluminescent. And you turn off all the lights and you put a CCD camera in front of it and turn it on, and the human body glows in the dark. Um, there is a study done, are you familiar with what's called a, uh, a cloud chamber? They use it in, when they take a, an electronic, or a electron accelerator, a particle accelerator, and you know, collide these two particles together within the cloud chamber, which is a supercooled ammonia vapor, you can see the trails of these subatomic particles as they're going through the cloud chamber. Um, they discovered quite by accident the technician here about a year ago who when he got near the cloud chamber was creating wave patterns inside the cloud chamber. He can take his hands and put them on the side of the cloud chamber and go like this and change the wave patterns inside the cloud chamber without touching, without any physical effect whatsoever. So we are finally getting to the point where our technology is catching up with our humanity where we're finally beginning to sense through scientific measurement those types of things that energy workers, that shamans, that healers have been talking about for thousands of years. Those energetic fields around the human body are very real. We're now beginning to be able to measure them, so science is now discovering them. And, you know, we have to laugh at that, that concept. But, you know, modern, sci modern science is catching up to, you know, the, the ancient practices of tens of thousands of years and just barely beginning to understand the facts that we have operated within for eons. Yeah. Thank you. 
accurate representation of what the shamanic traditions have, have been telling us and the spiritual traditions have been telling us. So it's, it's a very interesting time, and his practice has brought me to do a lot of study, and I'm just beginning to get some clues about that. Um, but one of the things that seems really interesting that I've come across is that there is, within the energies, there's a, a movement, energy movement, literally, where it had sort of been in, in Asia and in China for a period of years having to do with the 13,000 year shift. And now my understanding from some of the stuff I'm reading is that it is moving back into the, or not back necessarily, but into the um, Andes and into the into that space. Apparently the spiritual folks, shamans, are drifting back and there will be a gathering next year of many of the old teachers. So I'm curious to know if you can speak to any of that or um, I'm just very interested in, in how all of that is, is well it's come my way and I find it very interesting well worth considering and looking at. Okay. Um, we've probably all seen or read articles or seen things on the uh, winter solstice for the year 2012. Um, and there have been popular movies come out, talk about the end of existence, the end of this, the end of the world. Um, the Laika shaman have actually been speaking of that for years. They call this the time of Pachacuti. Pacha means earth. Akuti is an overturning or a mulching. Um, the end of the Mayan calendar is a well-known concept throughout the shamanic community. The Mayans are the ones who carved it in stone which made it something that people paid attention to. Um, but if you look back over the, the rhythm of time over the last 26,300 years, which is the, the long count of the Mayan calendar, they've had events that mark that pathway that we see occurring. Um, the last really significant event was um, the Spanish conquest of the Americas. That was a, an event that was foretold on, yeah, of, you know, within the, the concept of that Central and South American mythology. Um, there were two brothers at the time uh, who were the Incan, the sons of the Incan ruler. One of them was Huascar, and one of them was Atahualpa. Um, the mythology states that men from the east would come and the empires would fall during the reign of Atahualpa, okay, or pardon me, during the reign of Huascar. He was the older brother. So his younger brother, Atwalpa, killed him in hopes that he would put off this collapse of the empire. Now, of course, that did not take place. It was, you know, with just within a few years, the Spanish were arriving, and of course, all of that took place and began to fulfill the, the prophetic destiny of the, the Americas. But what they talk about on the 2012 date, okay, is, is we don't look at it as a, a line that we run up to and embark onto something new. If you imagine that December 21st, 2012 as a, you know, a teeter-totter, and we're coming up this side, what we're looking at is the consciousness of man becoming an energetic being rather than a physical being. And as we near that time point of December 21st, 2012, 
that consciousness will then shift. And what we will have at that point is a preponderance of the world culture will understand effectively that we are energetic spiritual beings and not just physical beings. Whereas right now, most of us see ourselves as being physical. So, you know, within that tipping point, okay, about 40 years each side of it, we have the Pachacuti taking place, which is the overturning. Um, there are cultures which are predicting that up to two-thirds of the population of the Earth during that time frame will be lost, um, you know, to catastrophic events. Uh, there are those who, you know, think that, you know, the, the world will end. Um, you know, they talk about that date as being the end of time. And, of course, from a shamanic perspective, the concept of time is an ordinary reality issue. And so where we talk about moving from one perspective to the other, when we talk about it being the end of time, what they're talking about is being the end of time as we know it. We get to the point where you can journey back to the beginning of the universe and experience that event, where you can journey forward to the end of the universe and experience that event. Um, within the context of our human lives, you can go back to the time of an original wounding or the original you know, event that caused a disease and change it there. And then as you move forward in time, that's different. You can find out things that will happen in the future and what you need to do now in order to change your momentum to get to that particular point in the future. So it will just be an end of time. And yeah, as the consciousness level raises, um, you know, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, David Hawkins, all of these people talk about uh, the morphogenetic fields. They talk about attractor fields. You know, you'll notice it when you go up and you start looking at the tomatoes in Publix, you know. All of a sudden, everybody else wants to look at tomatoes in Publix. You know, that's an attractor field. Um, I think we're about out of time, so are there any more questions or... Okay. Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, back on the back table, I have some of business cards and a brochure, and in there I have a website. Okay, on the back, it's the Shaman Circle. If you go in there, there's a reading list. I probably got a hundred books on there. Um, and I update that often. And I typically look at the book and, you know, read through it, give a little, you know, paragraph as far as to the content of the book, and it's relevant. Um, it's www.theshamancircle.com. So, um, yes. Oh, that's, um, that's not required. no, it's not required by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, and as a matter of fact, within the United States, the possession of DMT is a federal offense because DMT is a Schedule One drug. Um, you know, it has no medical use. So, uh, so within the United States. We don't do that. If you want an ayahuasca ceremony, you typically have to travel to South America for that. Uh, but no, we we work without the ayahuasca here. Yeah. Um, what about peyote? Well, if you're a member of the Native American Church, peyote is you're exempt from its regulation. Yeah. Um, again, the, the mescaline and the peyote. Um, you know, there's actually a frog. Uh, it's a, a toad, you know, that's, um, I don't remember, it's a member of the Bufa species, however, but it secretes, yeah, it secretes a, you know, a waxy substance which has the 
bufotene, which is a, a DMT derivative in it also. So in every culture, actually, here in the United States, we have a weed that grows common everywhere. It's called Phalaris grass. It's a big grass. It grows in a bunch about this big. It's perennial. Um, it has really high levels of DMT in it. So if you have any of that growing in your yard, it's the same as if you have marijuana growing in your yard. So, <clears throat> you know, I mean, those are, within every culture, I think the cosmos has placed the ability for those who are seeking that pathway into non-ordinary reality. But again, there's ways to get there without it. And they are just as easy but you have to deal with, like I say, that cognitive barrier that often is very, very difficult to get through.